Now I just got to get up. All right, y'all, open in your Bible to 1 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians, 1 Chronicles chapter 12. I mentioned this earlier, and I couldn't remember the verse. Um, we were talking about understanding the times in which we live. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, there is a list of David's mighty men as they were in Ziklag, and it tells us in 1 Chronicles 12 and verse number 32, the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, he says to know what Israel ought to do, and the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandments. And so I was making the point that throughout the history of uh, God's people, there's always been a need for having men who understood the times. And know, uh, the, the text here says to know what Israel ought to do. And of course we would say it. Men that had understanding of the times to know what the church ought to do. And so that was the verse. And I apologize for not remembering it. Uh, but it's First Chronicles 12, verse number 32. So now let's turn to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. And for our visitors, what we do on the uh, last Sunday of the month when we have potluck, we're studying through the Psalms in our afternoon service. So we've made it thus far to Psalm 68. And uh, it's one of the rather long Psalms that we're going to be studying. And so uh, that's why I said a moment ago that you will be able to take a little nap but as we really think about the text, uh, I've drawn the title, and if you notice in the bulletin, the title for our lesson, Psalm 68 and verse number 19, where David writes, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. We'll talk about that text in more detail in just a moment, but you may remember. Yes, sir. That ain't what I'm reading on mine, 6819. 6819? Blessed be the Lord who daily thought loaded us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. I'm sorry, I, verse 19. I, I'm looking at, I apologize, Jim. Verse 19. Blessed be the Lord. This, and it's right there on the, the thing if I'd looked up. <laughs> Who daily loadeth us with benefits. That's, that's the title of our lesson this afternoon. I apologize, I picked the wrong verse. Uh, but it's right there on Psalm 68 and verse 19. So uh, I was reading verse 18. But uh, the point is, notice that David said, God who daily loadeth us with benefits. We'll explain what that means more in just a moment. But let's think about the background of this psalm. It is apparently, and we don't know exactly the background, apparently it was written about the time that the nation of Israel brings the Ark of the Covenant to the city of Jerusalem. It's recorded, you remember, in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And you remember in 2 Samuel chapter 6, at the beginning of the chapter, they actually move the cart the wrong way. And you remember as they're moving that cart, when they came to the threshing floor, that Uzzah, the, the ark kind of tips, the oxen stumble, and Uzzah reaches up, touches the ark, and God strikes him dead for touching the ark. They were told not to touch the ark. And so Uzzah died for touching the ark. And you remember at that point, David stops transporting the ark. He leaves it at the threshing floor of Obed-Edom until he has the time to inquire of God how should we move the ark. Now I put in my notes when I'm teaching this at the men's uh, or at the school of preaching, he asked the right question at the wrong time. He should have asked how do we move the ark before he ever starts moving the ark? But he doesn't do that. And he takes and moves the ark uh, like the, um, well, let me, let me turn over to 2 Samuel. 
I apologize. It's been a long week, and y'all y'all know that. So they were transporting the ark. Uh, I believe the Philistines had taken the ark. They get the ark back, and they're bringing the ark to the city of Jerusalem. And when Uzzah touches the ark, God strikes him dead. And then David tell asks, "Well, God, how do we actually transport the ark?" And of course, that verse is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse number 25. And God says, here's the way the ark is to be moved. And it's according to the directions that God had already given the children of Israel when He told them how to move the ark in the, the uh, books of the law. And they had forgotten it or whatever. They had ignored it. But anyway, back to the text of Psalm 68. They then after inquiring of God, move the ark the correct way, and it comes into the city of Jerusalem. There's much rejoicing. There's much dancing. We will see it in just a moment. Uh, they were dancing and praying and, and worshiping God, singing these songs of praise. So David has that in mind. But to begin the song, he says in verses 1 through 19 that David reminds the nation of Israel of the deliverance that God had given them as they left the Egyptian bondage. So those first 19 verses are a reminder of the benefits that God, as we read a moment ago in Psalm 68, He daily loadeth us with benefits. So as they came out of Egyptian bondage, they moved to the promised land. David reminds them of what happened. So let's go ahead and read it together. It says, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before them. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Verse 3 But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God, yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. I'm going to pause there. In these opening verses, David is just reminding them that when God rises up, that the enemies of God are going to flee before Him. As we said a moment ago, this is the nation of Israel as they're leaving Egyptian bondage and God is scattering those nations in front of them. And so David says, when the enemies of God fall, the righteous rejoice. Verse 3. He says in verse number 4, sing unto the Lord, or sing unto God, sing praises to His name, extol Him that rideth upon the heavens by His name, Yah. You look at it and it looks like Jah uh, in ours. It's Yah and rejoice before Him. That is a shortened form of the name Jehovah. So it's Jah or Yah as they would say. And it means the Lord most vehement. This is the side of God that people don't like to acknowledge. We like to, we like to think of God as an old grandfather that's sitting there with all the little grandkids around him. He never chastises them. He doesn't just love and hug on them. And that's the picture of God that many people have. This is not God as revealed in the Bible. The God of the Bible, is He loving, tender, compassionate? Absolutely. But He is also Yah, the Lord most vehement. And that's what the enemies of Israel were seeing at this time is God's bringing them out of Egyptian bondage. He destroys the Egyptians in Exodus chapter uh, 30 and wipes them out. And then He begins to bring them to the promised land. When they get to the promised land, the Perizzites, the Hivites, all those ites that are talked about, God drives them out. So this is Yah. This is the Lord most vehement. And he says we need to sing praises to this God and rejoice before Him. Now notice He is the Lord most vehement. But then notice what it says in verse 5. 
a father to the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. So he presents both sides of God. There is the Lord who is most vehement, the Lord who fights for his people, the Lord who destroys his enemies, but on the other hand, he is a God who is a father to the fatherless. He is a God that takes care of the widows. Beautiful contrast of the God that we serve. He is both, and he must be both to be God. He cannot be God and not be just. God is just in His attributes. Evil must be punished, but He is also the God of love. So it says in verse 6 that God setteth the solitary in families. He's talking about the solitary, the orphans. He takes the orphans and He puts them into families. What a beautiful thought. So God takes the solitary and brings him into families. Don't we love that about the church? We may not have an earthly family out here, but God will put us in with our brethren. And so God sets the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. O oh God, when Thou wentest forth before Thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness. And notice that word Selah at the end of that verse. So clearly, we see in verse 7 the setting being drawn out. God is leading the nation out of Egyptian bondage. And David says Selah, which we talked about, pause. And it's one of those where you're supposed to stop for a moment and think about what he's just said. So God is Yah, the Lord most vehement, but He is also a father to the fatherless. He's also a judge of the widows. He takes orphans and puts them with families. And David said, let that sink in for just a moment. So verse number 8. Again, as they come out of Egyptian bondage, the earth shook. The heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Now watch this. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. So he's going back to Exodus chapters 19 and 20 where the children of Israel, they left Egyptian bondage. They've traveled now. They are at the foot of Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is quaking with the very presence of God in the sight of all the people. Remember how afraid the people were? They told Moses, we don't want to hear God talk anymore. You go up there and talk to Him. We're done listening to Him. We're too afraid to hear the very voice of God. And so Moses went up on Mount Sinai. That's what David is talking about. So remember that as we go through the rest of the psalm, especially those first 19 verses, this is the children of Israel coming out of Egyptian bondage, sitting on Mount Sinai or at the foot of Mount Sinai as Moses is receiving the law. The mountain is shaking at the presence of God. Verse 9, Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain. How many times did the children of Israel complain that they didn't have anything to drink? And God gave them water. That's what David is reminding the nation of Israel. God gave you rain, water, when you needed it most. So He is a God that sent plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. Thy congregation hath dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. So now, as you see, as he says in uh, verse number 11, God gave His Word. Well, what is he talking about? Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai. God gave His Word to the people. And he said, and great was the company of those that published it. So those thousands, it's been estimated two to three million of Israel 
came out of Egyptian bondage. So you've got the mountain surrounded by the nation of Israel. Mount Moses is on the top of the mount receiving the law. The tribes are scattered two to three million and he says, this great company, God used them to publish His Word. Verse 12, Kings of army did flee apace, and she that tarrieth at home divided the spoil. Notice again the idea of the armies of God marching, the enemies falling before them. And he says in verse 13, Though ye have leaned among the pots. Uh, that's an interesting way of saying you were slaves. You were working over the pot. You can see the picture of a slave laboring over a pot, whether it's a pot of food or as the children of Israel in Egyptian bondage were building uh, the pyramids. They're laboring over the pot, whether they're mixing uh, clay or whatever they're doing. So you were, he says, a slave, yet ye shall be as the wings of a dove. We're still in verse 13. Covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. Look at that beautiful picture of deliverance. You were a slave, but now God has mounted you on the wings of an eagle. And the wings, he says, are silver. The feathers are covered with gold. Verse 14, when the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as the snow in Salmon. So when God, the, the whiteness is the destruction and the purity of God. And so as God went through, He divides this out as the snow in Mount Salmon. Verse 15, He says, The hill of God as as the hill of Bashan, a high hill as high as the hill of Bashan. This is going to the children of Israel before they cross the Jordan River to go into the promised land. Before they cross the river, they fled from Egyptian bondage. They wandered in the wilderness. They're on the east side of the Jordan River. That's where Mount Bashan is. So this is a picture of the deliverance of God. This mountain is known. It's Mount Hermon is the actual name, but it's called the Mount of Bashan. So you can look up Mount Hermon in your, your Bible dictionaries and online find more about this high mountain. But he says in verse 16, Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the hill which God desireth to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. Now verse 17 is an interesting verse. As a matter of fact, this entire chapter, Psalm, is disputed whether it even belongs in the Bible. There were those that looked at it and said the language does not fit. It doesn't belong in the Bible. And there were those that wanted to put it among the apocryphal writings, those writings that were not biblically inspired. They said this, this just doesn't mesh. But it does, brethren. David knew what he was doing when he penned the psalm, and David knew what he was doing when he included it in the book of Psalms. That is, brethren, you stop and you think about that. What a slap in the face of God. God is not intelligent enough to know who He is and what His people need to hear. But notice the language. He says the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Part of the dispute is this word angels. They don't know exactly how to, and this is where they get into trouble. They don't know exactly how to translate the word. And so they try to look at the surrounding context. They try to draw, well, what is he meaning by the word angels? Or what is, I don't know the Hebrew word. I looked it up, but I can't remember. But they're like, what does it mean? And so uh, they got together and they decided, well, let's translate it as angels. It means it is a term of infinity, if I understand correct, innumerable. And so what he's saying is, if I'm understanding the context, the only way to understand it's the context, right? How is it used? We use this illustration. You've heard it before. If I say I saw a dog today, you would understand a four-legged animal. If I say you're a dog, 
You understand I'm not calling you a four-legged animal. I'm using that derived. So the only way you know what I'm talking about is by the context, right? So what is the context of this verse? The context is God giving the law of Moses on Mount Sinai and two to three million Jews surrounding the mountain, right? That's the picture of Exodus 19, Exodus 20. We've all studied that. We know that. And so I would understand what he's saying is that God's army is setting at the foot of Mount Sinai. Why the word angel? I don't know. I don't, I don't understand why that was translated like that. Because when we think of angel, what do we always do? Well, that's, that's a, a little fluffy thing flying around heaven with wings that looks like a chubby child, right? That's what we think of angels. And, and we've allowed that even in the Lord's church to creep into our ideas that we think of angels. You see the word angel, well, it's a celestial being. Not always. The word angel means messenger. So God, remember what He said just a moment ago. And don't forget this. He said that the Lord in verse 11 gave His word and great was the company of those that published it. So now take that and put it with verse 17. He's simply using this chariot of God, thousands of thousands, as the nation of Israel gathered at Mount Sinai. Now, I will tell you this. You can pick up a hundred commentaries and probably none of them agree with what I've just said. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I, I, I'm going, I don't bow at the foot of any man, I'll tell you that. And I'm going to look at the context and I'm going to try to draw my own conclusions. That's the conclusion I've drawn. You look at it. You study it. You read the commentaries. If you don't agree, fine. I mean, it, what, is, what, what, if, what if it is angels? Celestial beings. Do we not know that God has celestial beings at His beck and call? Sure. Not saying that they're not angels. Jesus said... He could have called 12 legions of angels. That's about 60,000. So when we sing the song, He could have called 10,000 angels. Angels, We're only about 50,000 off on our number. <laughs> you know? So, so I, I, don't, I don't have a problem if that's what He's talking about. But I don't see it from the context. So anyway, we've chased that rabbit as far as we're going to go. So verse 18. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Does that verse seem a little familiar? He has led captivity captive. It ought to because Paul uses this verse in Ephesians chapter 4. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. By the way, this also is an indication to me that I may be on the right track in my understanding of this. Because the very next verse, what Paul is going to do in Ephesians chapter 8 is talk about the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we are God's messengers today, right? We're His company today. So look at what He says. In, uh, and we know this, we'll begin in Ephesians 4 and verse 4. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We know that's the platform of unity for the church, right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's our platform of unity. But notice he goes on to say in verse 7, but unto every one of us. Now who is the us in that verse? It's the church. Can't be anybody else. So he says, but unto every one of us is given grace. Now think about what we read in Psalm 68 verse 18. Even the rebellious can be a part of the family of God. Now we can't be a part of the family of God and continue in rebellion. But God opens the eye. Aren't you thankful? Because <laughs> if, you, if you're like me, and I know that many of us are, 
Were we rebellious at one time? Well, yeah, I see people going, well, yeah, not me. Yeah, yeah, well, we all know about rebellion, right? And God brought the rebellious the opportunity, the grace to bring even the rebellious into the church. I think this is a beautiful statement. But he goes on to say that he gives, verse 7, every one of us is given grace. Now remember what he said in Psalm 68, that it's a prophecy of Jesus Christ releasing us from our captivity of sin, releasing the church. And he said, God the Father gave God the Son the grace or the gifts to save mankind. That's a beautiful thought. And so he says in verse number 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now remember the Psalm 68, the Father gave him gifts for men. And one of those gifts was the gift of grace, right? So look at this, brethren, in the context God gave Jesus. When He ascended on high, brethren, when He hung on that cross, He died for my sins and for your sins, and He released us from our captivity. That's what David is prophesying about. Why do I know it belongs in the Bible? Because Paul said it belongs in the Bible. He quotes it and says, this is a part of the Word of God, and it's a prophecy about our Messiah uh, Jesus the Christ. And so, back to Ephesians 4 and verse 8. When He ascended up on high, when He hung on the cross, He led captivity captive, and then He gave gifts unto men. Well, God gave Him the gifts in Psalm 68. Ephesians 4, what is Jesus doing with those gifts? He's keeping them for Himself and enjoying them. No, no. He's giving it to all of us. So all those gifts that God had given him, he's not a stingy Savior. He gives us those gifts. Great, great. Now continue. This is an inspired commentary by Paul on Psalm 68. What do you mean by that, David? Now he that ascended, that's what he says in verse 9, what is it but he that also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Do you see that? The one that was hung on high? What happened? He went into the earth. The heart of the earth. He was buried for three days and three nights. He's resurrected then. And it tells us in verse number 10, He that descended is the same also that ascended. Now watch, this is the resurrection. The first on high, the cross. Buried in the tomb for three days and three nights. Then He ascends back to the throne room of God. And watch this. He that, we're in Ephesians 4.10. He that descended is also the same that ascended up far above all heavens that He might fill all things. Verse number 11. And He gave some... What were the gifts that God gave to him? Us. And he says some of us, I'm not saying we are apostles today, but in the first century, apostles. Some prophets. And some evangelists. And some pastors. And some teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. There's a lot in Psalm 68, and I'm glad y'all are still awake. <laughs> verse 18 is a power-packed verse. And then, the verse that I missed a moment ago, I apologize, verse 19, Blessed be the Lord, who ever once in a while, when He feels like it, is that what it says? When, he, when He's in a good mood, daily, Daily. Now watch this. Loadeth us. Now you can't load something with a teaspoon, brethren. You've got to have a shovel to load some. God is daily loading us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. And as then David says, huh, pause and think about that. So then the last part. 
after reminding the children of Israel of their deliverance from Israel, he now turns to the fulfillment, the bringing of the ark to Jerusalem. That's the crowning jewel of God's creation in Israel. The Ark of the Covenant being brought to its permanent dwelling place. Look beginning in verse 20. He that is our God is the God of salvation. And unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. But God shall wound the head of the enemies and the hairy scalp of the one as he goeth on still in his trespasses. He's reminding them the God that we serve is not that old grandpa up in heaven. He is Yah, the most vehement, remember? So he says, the Lord said in verse 22, I will bring again from Bashan. I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea that they may, that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies. This is where the commentators start stroking out. This, this is why they say this language is too graphic to be a part of the Bible. But wake up. <laughs> Just wake up. I, 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 I'm not saying y'all wake up. I'm saying these commentators <laughs> wake up. Because look, if you don't understand that God is vehement, you need to wake up. So he says, Your foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of the dogs in the same. They have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of my God, my King in the sanctuary. Now notice verse 25. Here's the ark coming to Jerusalem. The singers went before. The players on instruments followed after. Among them were the damsels playing the timbrels. Go back and read 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm sorry. First, yeah, 2 Samuel chapter 6 when they bring the ark in. David even danced before the Lord. Do you remember that? And his wife, Micah, or excuse me, Michael, saw him dancing and she's infuriated. She despised him from that moment on because David actually danced like a common man. She said, you should have had on your royal garb. You should have presented yourself in a king and you're dancing around like you're a common man. He said, I was dancing before my God. So he says, the singers went before the players on the instruments, the damsels with their timbrels. Verse 26, Bless ye God in the congregations, even the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin with their ruler. That's David. He's, 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 he's talking about David coming from the area of Benjamin. And he's not a Benjamite, but that's where he was living. He says, you little bitty Benjamin with their ruler and princes of Judah and their council, the princes of Zebulun, the princes of Naphtali, thy God hath commanded thy strength. Strengthen, O God, that which thou hast wrought for us because of thy temple at Jerusalem. Shall kings bring presents unto thee? Rebuke the company of the spearmen, the multitude of the bulls, with the calves of the people, till everyone submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. David was a warrior. And I don't remember which king it was, uh, which king, which general it was after World War II. I think it may have even been Patton. There's nobody that hates war like a warrior. And that's a paraphrase. I don't remember his exact language. David says, God doesn't want war. He wants peace. There's a lot in that. A lot in that. Scatter them, verse 30, that delight in war. 31, princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. Remember when the queen of Bathsheba comes to see David? Verse 32, sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. Oh, sing praises unto the Lord. And again he says, Selah, pause. Verse 33, to him that rideth upon the heaven of heavens, which were of old, lo, he doth send out his voice, and that a mighty voice. Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel. His strength is in the clouds. O oh God, Thou art terrible out, and that word terrible there is awesome. Thou art awesome out of thy holy place. 
The God of Israel is He that giveth strength and power unto the people. Blessed be God. I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired now. <laughs> that's a lot in a psalm, isn't it? Man, that's great stuff. <clears throat> Wore me out. But I appreciate you not dozing off. I, I think we all know the point of the lesson. And, and I think we've made it abundantly clear <clears throat> that when Jesus... Let, let's back up. When God delivered the nation of, the, uh, of Israel, that's just a shadow of God delivering us as the church. When, when the ark comes to the very temple of God in Jerusalem, that is just a picture of the beauty of God dwelling among His people in the church today. So don't tell me Psalm 68 is a, is a boring psalm and don't tell me it doesn't belong in the Bible because it's a marvelous, wonderful statement of God in, in the midst of that, Jesus, descending out of heaven, walking among mankind, dying, hanging on high, and bringing the captive out of their captivity, descending into the ground to the lower parts of there, and then ultimately resurrected, then ultimately brought to heaven. This is a glorious psalm. And it's about us. <laughs> it's about the church and what Jesus did in bringing gifts. So I hope this has been a beneficial psalm for you. If you're not a Christian this evening, you know what you need to do. If you've never been baptized into Christ, Brother Britt's going to lead us in an invitation song. If you have a need and we can help, please come as we stand and as we sing.